Uh, is my audio okay? Dan, is my audio okay? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so anyway, um, toward HHR norms and equivariant factorization homology for compact Lie groups. Um, nominally, this is a topic in uh, equivariant stable homotopy theory, but I'm not going to assume any kind of familiarity with equivariant stable homotopy theory and keep all of that to a minimum. I'm not going to assume any familiarity with the concept of, of norm, and I'm actually going to start with the background on this. And here's the historical background. Um, in most other contexts, when people say the word norm, a norm is some kind of map. And um, the related kind of map to the thing that I'm <clears throat> talking about today are, well, they're the norm maps, also called multiplicative transfers. And these were uh, formulated by Greenlease May in a 1997 annals paper inspired by a construction of Evans in group cohomology. These norms are maps, and let's agree to call them uh, Greenlease, May, Gre Greenlease May norms. The norms I'm going to talk about today are objects and not maps. These were formulated by Hill Hopkins Ravenel in their 2016 annals paper, and uh, they're the domain and codomain for a diagonal map, which is, I don't know if it's half or a third, but some some portion of um, the map in the Greenlease May norm. So I call these Hill Hopkins Ravenel norms to distinguish from the Greenlease May norms, but of course they're uh, closely related things. So let me start with some remarks on the HHR norm. Um, of course, there's the paper by Hill Hopkins Ravenel where they solve the career invariant problem. And this was an important tool in that paper. So you might imagine that uh, it could be useful to solve other kind of problems. Uh, but in fact, even if not, it turns out that these norms are important foundationally. Blumberg Hill in a series of papers showed that uh, the, the key idea foundationally in classifying multiplicative structures in equivariant stable homotopy theory. And uh, a paper of Hill and Hopkins shows that if you want a, if you want a genuine equivariant notion of um, symmetric monoidal category, this, uh, the, the Hill-Hopkins-Ravenel norm uh, plays a key role in that. Okay, so that's the historical background. Let me talk about what the norm is trying to capture, what the idea of the HHR norm is. And um, it's, it's something about spectra, but let me start with spaces. So let X be a space. And then you can make another space by taking a Cartesian product of copies of X um, indexed on the elements of G. And then this will have an action of G where you just permute the coordinates. And if you think about what the fixed points of this space is, well, it's just going to be X back again, it's, and it's going to be given by uh, the diagonal map. The diagonal map is going to give an isomorphism between X and, um, and the fixed points of this space. OK, so now let's try to do it with spectra. And um, maybe you could think about the suspension spectrum of, of X. Um, and we could take a, a smash product of copies of a spectrum Z indexed on the elements of a group. And at least now that we have um, you know, point set symmetric monoidal categories of spectra, this kind of thing should certainly have some kind of G action. And then you can ask, what are the fixed points of this G action? The fixed points should form a spectrum. In equivariant stable homotopy theory, there's various kinds of fixed points. And the, the fixed points that um, correspond, at least under, the, under suspension, to um, what we're used to of, with the fixed points of, of spaces are called the geometric fixed points. So what's the geometric fixed point spectrum of a construction like this? Um, and you might expect it to be uh, it, you might expect it to just be Z. Um, and in fact, that's what the HHR norm does. It gives you a construction of something like this. Um, it gives you an equivariant spectrum that non-equivariantly non is the smash product of copies of Z. Um, and it comes with a diagonal map to the geometric fixed points, which is an isomorphism, just like, just like happened for spaces. So that's the idea of the HHR norm. 
Okay, so the, the talk is nominally about HHR norms for compact Lie groups. So this slide is about what, what, what we can do with, um, you know, what we can do at, at present, the current state of the art. Well, if G is a, oops, if G is a compact Lie group and H is a finite index subgroup, then uh, we can make, we can, we can just do the norm. And it's just the same construction from Greenlee's Mayer, from Hill Hopkins, Ravenel. It just, it's, it's just, um, it's just smash product of, of copies and um, some, uh, some kind of uh, G equivariant structure. Okay, if G is a one dimensional compact Lie group like the circle or a uh, finite extension of the circle, extension of the circle by a finite group, um, then in a paper by Engelweit, Blumberg, Gerhardt, Hill, Lawson, and Mandel around 2018, we construct um, we construct uh, an HHR norm for that. Um, and if you look, I, I wrote Z here and I wrote A here, and there was a reason for that. If we look closely about what we're asking for, if we do a norm like this, non-equivariantly, uh, this norm is supposed to be the smash product of copies of A indexed on G mod H. And if um, G mod H is, um, is finite, if it's a finite set, then I know how to make a smash product indexed on a finite set, and I know how to do the norm. If G mod H is, for example, the circle group, then it turns out that for, you know, sometimes I know how to make sense of the smash product um, indexed on the circle of copies of A, specifically if, if A is some kind of um, associative ring spectrum, then I have something called uh, THH. And if you've thought about the construction of THH, what it's trying to do is exactly give you this kind of construction, the smash product indexed on the circle of copies of, of A. Right, and in this paper, um, what we show is that for any, so associative algebra, that's an E1 algebra for any E1 algebra, um, uh, the norm um, is equivalent to THH with the genuine equivariant homotopy type that you, um, that goes into the construction of TC. So, um, so that suggests that, um, you know, that's, that's another indication that the, the HHH our norm uh, might be important even for compact Lie groups. Okay, so you might ask the question, how are we supposed to make sense of this smash product in general, smash product over some kind of space in general, at least non-equivariantly? And, um, and we know the answer to this question too, right? Um, this kind of smash product is exactly what factorization homology is supposed to, is supposed to give us. Um, and here's the notation for it. And let me tell you uh, what that notation means. So I'll tell you about an input and a particular output. And here's the notation for the output. You plug in something called A and you plug in a manifold M and you get out a spectrum, let's say at least a non-equivariant spectrum, uh, for, at least for starters. And what goes into it is we can take the factorization homology when we plug in a manifold and then the kind of algebra we need is something called a, a GLN framed EN algebra. So EN algebra is, um, is the kind of thing it, it always means in these, in these talks. It means some kind of algebra over the little disk operat. And I'll, I'll say more about what that means later. Uh, in this case, if I don't make any hypotheses on the manifold, actually I should say, if I don't give the manifold any additional structure, I need more than just um, some kind of n-fold, you know, some kind of en multiplication on a. I also need an action of gln on a that interacts with that multiplication in an appropriate way. Um, but that's just one choice. If I'm willing to uh, give the manifold some extra structure, like a um, reduction of structure group of its um, of its of its tangent space. Um, so if I if I have a reduction of structure group to some group h then I only need H to act on the EN algebra. So in, as a particular case, if I, if, I take, um, if I take G to be a compact Lie group, 
compact Lie group is parallelizable, I can reduce its structure group all the way down to the trivial group. And so I can make sense of at least non-equivariant, at least there's no trouble making sense of the factorization homology uh, over G of, of A uh, for any ED algebra A where D is the dimension of the Lie group. Okay, so I've been talking non-equivariantly, but actually if, we're, if, we're, if we want equivariance with respect to finite groups, you can make this all work. Um, and I, I listed some references for this. Maybe the genuine theory really starts here. Um, um, but you can, you can, you know, if you have a finite group acting, you can actually come up with a genuine equivariant theory. And um, it's related to the norm, really. If you look at uh, G cross, uh, rather G mod H cross Rn, and you take the factorization homology on that manifold um, in the, you know, using the genuine equivariant theory, um, that's, this is results of four of, I think, um, it actually gives you the norm. Remember, this is in the finite group case. It actually gives you the norm. And, you know, you expect this to be true also in the case of, um, you know, non-finite compact Lie groups. You expect this to be the case in the positive dimensional case. Um, and so what this says is that the HHR norm is the starting point for equivariant factorization homology. So if you're interested in generalizations of factorization homology um, to you know, to actions of compact Lie groups, the first thing you have to understand is the HHR norm. Okay, so why can't you just sit down and do it? What are the issues? Why, why is this towards um, HHR norms and not constructions of HHR norms? Um, so the first complication is, comes from the foundations of factorization homology as they're currently written. Um, the rest of the talk is actually about this, so let me put a pin on that in that and come back to it. Another um, complication is uh, the equivariant homotopy theory of the smash power. Um, if we, if we, you, you know, we, can, we look at the functor, a spectrum goes to x to the nth smash power, and if this is an equivariant spectrum, this is an action of sigma n and g, and as far as that goes, I think we, we actually do kind of understand it. But really, it should have an action of sigma n wreath g, right? You have n copies of g acting commuted by the symmetric group. And if we want to understand that action, it looks like we need to work in terms of parameterized stable homotopy theory over orbits. And um, well, that's, that's a whole story. And um, uh, in the compact Lie group case for, for positive dimensional compact Lie group, case, um, there's, there's something to work out there. In the finite group case, if you're, if you're parameterized over a discrete space, that's, you know, that's just the same thing as having a bunch of copies. It's the, it's, you know, you can, you can work unparameterized. And um, so that's, um, that's a bit easy, easier and um, you don't have to worry so much. So that's, that's the, another complication. And then even if you understand both of those things, it's sort of non-trivial to fit them together. So there's a, a third, I mean, even once you are okay here and okay here, there's a, a, a sort of third thing to work out uh, in terms of the homotopy theory, putting them together. Okay, so the rest of the talk is gonna be talking about factorization homology and it's gonna be completely non-equivariant. Um, so the idea is, you know, adapt fact, the foundations of factorization homology to be uh, amenable to studying things that have compact Lie group actions, but we're not actually yet going to put those actions in. Okay, and this is going to be, this is, uh, I'm talking about work that's 75 to 85% done uh, with Andrew Blumberg. Um, and um, so what are the complications in the current foundations? Well, if, if you're gonna have a compact Lie group acting um, that's, not, that's not discrete, then you're going to want, you know, you're, that has a, you know, that has a continuous action. You're going to want to avoid simplicial approximation, or at least it's a prejudice of people who work with compactly group actions that compactly groups aren't simplicial sets. And um, um, and if you, you know, if you if you do a simplicial approximation, you you've thrown away a lot of the geometry. So you know, even if you work out something that works for um, 
that works and you use simplicial approximation, you're going to have to you know, reintegrate it to something without simplicial approximation at the end to make the people who work in this area happy. And th that unfortunately, unfortunately means that you have to give up on quasi-categorical methods. And because most of the stuff is nowadays is written in those terms, that sounds like a big deal. Um, but actually, it turns out to be no big deal. That's the least of the problems. Um, the big problem is that when you, so, you know, I haven't found a, at, at least in this area of factorization homology, I haven't found a quasi-categorical argument that I can't translate into a, another kind of, I'm sorry, a quasi-categorical quasi construction that I can't translate into another construction, maybe even an argument that I can't translate into another argument. But when you take the, um, when you look at the arguments that actually get used in factorization homology, there's a local to global argument, or maybe a sheafy kind of argument where um, you prove something starting from a point or a point in configuration space. And if you look at a, a small open set around a point in configuration space, um, it looks like a configuration in, in a uh, disjoint union of Euclidean spaces. And if you have a discrete group acting, if you have a finite group acting, that's not really a big deal because, you know, if you look at the orbit, it still kind of looks like that. But, um, you know, if you have a compact Lie group acting, then your configuration gets smeared through your whole manifold, um, or maybe not the whole manifold, but it gets smeared out by, you know, here's just a one parameter smearing of it. And you can't just look at, you know, you can't just look at a small open set around a point in configuration space. You, you won't be able to say anything about, um, you won't be able to keep track of uh, the Lie group action that way. So what we do instead is, um, instead of using simplicial approximation, we use bar construction methods. And um, I think that these, the construction of factorization homology in terms of bar construction, rather than in terms of um, functors in, 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 in the infinity category world, I think that goes back to the beginning. I think it's at least as old as uh, the, 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 the most popular point of view. You can find uh, versions of this in Andrade's thesis in 2010, and, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't think this is the first place it appeared. I mean, it could be that it is the first place it appeared, but it goes back, you know, this goes back a long time. So this, this, uh, this first part, uh, avoiding quasi-categorical methods, I, we don't introduce anything new. This is old. This is an old idea. Uh, but we do what we do that's new is that. Um, now you have to now you have to prove things about these bar constructions, and where you would want to do this, you can't just restrict to a point. You have to um, you have to look at whole um, whole open subsets that are going to be uh, potentially be stable under the action of the compact Lie group. And uh, what we end up doing is we look at the bar construction and we break it up into uh, into pieces into components really. Um, that we can identify the homotopy type of, and the, we identify the homotopy type of these in terms of certain open subspace, subsets of the of configuration spaces. So that's our that's our strategy. We identify pieces of the bar construction as uh, as up to homotopy being open subsets in the configuration space. So the main tool for this is um, configuration space methods and specifically um, moving lemmas and flow arguments um, that come from the uh, min type Morse theory of uh, Baryshnikov, Bubinek, and Kale. Um, and just to, just to start by uh, introducing notation and um, uh, trying to uh, make it familiar, the kind of a sample result will prove, a, a sample result that I'll talk about is I will use this kind of notation for a piece, a component in a bar construction. Um, and this kind of notation will be a particular open set in a configuration space. And um, I'll talk about a homotopy equivalence between them. Um, and I'll, I'll talk, I'll explain it. I'll explain where it comes from it and hopefully explain it in a way that makes it plausible that pieces of the bar construction uh, really, really do look like open subsets of configuration space. 
Okay, so here goes. Um, so here's the notation that I'm going to use. Um, so when you see these these curvy m's, at least with an with an n with just an n attached, that's going to be the space of embeddings of uh, the D disk. Remember, D is our dimension. Um, the D disk cross one to n in m. So it's going to be um, an embedding of a disjoint union of disks into your into your manifold. So here's a picture of that. So in, in terms of um, the, the work that Blumberg and I are working out, um, we have to take into account framings, but um, they, they don't really play any role expositionally, so I'm going to leave them out of the exposition. And so that sort of amounts to pretending that M is parallelizable. Um, and then in, in that case, what I would do if I throw away the framings, then I would I'd, I'd look at um, disks that are parallel at the origin. That um, you know, if M has a parallelization, then you know I want the um, I want the frame on the, the sort of canonical frame on the disk to agree with the frame on the manifold uh, at the points that the origin goes to under under the embedding. And then another thing that um, will make the exposition a lot less complicated is if I assume that um, the embeddings I look at are, are surjective on pi zero. Um, so if the manifold's connected, that's that's no condition. But um, but if the manifold's disconnected, I want to make sure something lands in every component. Um, so this corresponds to working non-unitally with algebras, um, and it, um, it's 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 an expositional tool in this case, so that I don't have to talk about RON spaces and I can talk about configuration spaces the whole time. Okay, and then notation here, um, D, M, N, this is the space of embeddings of M copies of the disk in N copies of the disk. And I'm going to look at uh, embeddings that are, um, that are orthogonal affine. Okay, and again, since I'm eliminating framings, um, since I'm eliminating, eliminating fra framings, they're not just orthogonal, they should be uh, parallel at the origin, which means that they're just scalings and translations. And again, um, this, this non unital condition will, will make everybody's lives easier. Um, um, and it, it, it actually plays a structural rather than expositional role here. Um, but let me also assume that they're surjective on pi zero. And here's a picture of that. And surjective on pi zero just means that, so these gray disks are the target disks, and these red disks are um, the guys that are getting embedded in. And surjective on pi zero just means that every gray disk has to have at least one red disk in it. OK, so of course, um, this is a category. If I compose orthogonal affine embeddings, I get an orthogonal affine embedding. And that gives me a, uh, a composition. If I have L disks going into M disks and M disks going into N disks, I can compose and get map an embedding from L disks into N disks, and it's of course equivariant over uh, over that guy. <clears throat> okay, but um, but not just that. This category acts on um, acts on these spaces of embeddings, right? If I have um, if I have n copies of the disk embedded in M, and I have m copies of the disk embedded in n copies of the disk. I can compose those embeddings and get m copies of the disk embedded in m. And so I drew the little picture for uh, that corresponds to these little pictures. Um, the, um, the the sort of the, the pink areas aren't really there. They just they're just remembering where um, the original disks used to be. And I compose and I get um, six embeddings of six tiny little disks in here. Okay, so. This category acts on the right on this category. Um, an ED algebra, D is the dimension of the disks here. A, an ED algebra is an action of this category uh, on the left on a spectrum, or or you know, whatever you want. And, I mean, we're talking, I, I had spectral on the previous page, so it's a spectrum here. I could be, it could be on on anything, and then you would get a factorization homology theory um, for algebras of any sort and um, you know landing in that sort of um, that sort of category uh, but but spectra here so I have an, a left action of this category on this 
spectra and on the spectrum end, um, what it looks like in this case is, um, so if I have six copies of A, let me write six copies of A. Great, six copies of A. And they're gonna map to three copies of A. And I'm gonna use, um, this, is, this, this is six disks, this here is six disks embedded in three disks. So this represents an element of uh, D63. And that's the element I'm going to illustrate for you the multiplication of. And um, what this what this picture says is that um, you know factor two and factor four are going to together map into factor one. The next picture says that uh, factor one, five, and six together are going to map into factor two, and then the third factor is going to map into the third factor. Okay, so this is this is um, equivalent to the usual notion of uh, ED algebra where you use um, a little disks operad CD. In fact, if you are familiar with operads but not familiar with this thing, which is an example of a, of a prop, um, this, the little N, the little D disk operad, its end space is just the maps in this category from n to one. So we'll, we'll see this formula a lot and that's just the, the end space of the little disks operand. Okay, but it, it's, it's a bit more convenient to use the whole category uh, in this context. Okay, so when we have a left action and a right action, we can do uh, a two-sided bar construction, a sort of homotopy co-equalizer of those actions and in this notation, what it looks like is this, at the level dot. So dot will always stand for a number um, in this talk. Whenever you see k dot, you're supposed to think dot is a particular number. I'm just not telling you what it is. I could have written q. Sometimes I go back and forth and write q, but I, I was, I've been consistent with dot, right? So this is a particular number. And um, you know, I, I have this guy on the left and I have this guy on the right. And then in between, I take a bunch of copies of um, of the category. Okay, um, so in fact, this is the last time you'll see the spectrum A. Not only am I not equivariant, I'll no longer I'll no longer be stable homotopy theory. I'm just going to look at basically this part of the construction, and we'll be fully in spaces now. Um, oops, thought there was another slide. Okay, and so I want to look at this part of the construction and. You know, it sort of already decomposes in terms of what what these values k are, but I'm going to decompose it even further, right? It decomposes if I just look at this part of the construction without the a there. I put an extra n on the end. Well, it, it already decomposes in terms of the k, but each of these guys has lots of components to it. I want to decompose it all the way down into components. And the way I can do that um, is I look at how these disks map, right? If I look at um, if I look at this first this first space of this first space, it's it's embeddings of n copies of the disk into k zero copies of the disk. What's going to happen is that um, you know some of the disks might go to the same um, some of the disks here might go to the same disk here, and others go to a different disk. And if I look at if I think in terms of pi zero you know, some of these guys go to the same disk, some of these guys go to a, to the same disk, but a different one, and so on. Um, if I look at pi zero of, uh, if I look at what happens on pi zero, it specifies a partition of the numbers one to n. Right, which guys go to the same guy? Which guys, you know, which guys go to the same guy for each, for each different one of these disks here? And then if I look, here, well, the guys from here that go to the same guy here certainly still go to the same guy here. But now, if some of these guys go, if some of these disks get go to the same guy here, then there's other guys that will that will go to the same guy here. At any rate, if I look at where these guys go among these disks, I get another partition of n of one to n. 
this partition had k0 blocks, this partition will have k1 blocks. Um, and this partition, the relationship between these partitions is that every block here, you know, if you're in the same block here, you have to go to the same block here. So what that means is that uh, P0 is a refinement of P1. I'll actually express the relationship the other way. I'll write it this way, less than or equal to. Um, and I'll say that P1 is a coarsening of P0. And then if I look at the next one, I'll get another partition P2, which is a coarsening of P1, and so, and so on, all the way down to uh, P dot, which is a partition with K dot blocks, which is a coarsening of all of these guys. So what I will do is I will, I will uh, break this up into pieces by, if I have a sequence of, uh, if I have a sequence of, of coarsenings of partitions, that tells me uh, how I want the disks to go on pi zero, and I'll look at the subspace of this where the disks do that. Yes. And I'll write that as EM and then this sequence of partitions. Um, and if you, if you think about what the pieces are like, well, part P0 tells me what I'm going to do with the first n disks. So I have, um, I have a subspace of, oops, I have a subspace of these embeddings that follow the directions that P0 say to do. And then I probably should have written the next guy. The next guy is D of um, K0, K1. I look at the subset of that that, um, that do what, um, what the relationship between uh, P0 and P1 tell me to do. But if I look at the relationship between P0 and P1, some of the blocks here go to the same block here. And that tells me some of the, there's K1 blocks here, and I'm sorry, K0 blocks here and K1 blocks here. Some of the blocks go to the same block. And that tells me um, that I can recover, you know, you know, this tells me how I'm supposed to send the disks. And I look at the subspace of this where the disks do that and so on. Uh, down to here, where um, this is just um, uh, this is just another way of writing em k dot. But if you, if you remember, k dot meant um, the disk cross one to k dot. So you could think of k dot as representing this set. If I instead look at maps from the disk cross the set of blocks in in p dot. Uh, well, there's k blocks in p dot. I've just, instead of having them numbered by one to k dot, I've numbered them by the blocks. Okay, and that lets me get rid of the, that lets me get rid, get rid of the sigma k dot there. I could write k and then I could, you know, I'd have to write something like k here and then I would cross over sigma k dot or I can just number them the way they're naturally numbered. Okay, so that was a lot to throw at you. The takeaway from this slide is that I can break up given, so the, the bar construction breaks up into smaller pieces that are indexed by um, level partitions is what we call these, or maybe what they're called, a sequence of partitions and coarsenings. And I'll use this notation for it. Um, and this thing is just a product of uh, subsets here. And I'll illustrate that on the next slide and identify what those subsets look like. Okay, so here's an example. So I'm, I'm going to recycle the example from the uh, from a previous slide, right? We had this element of D63 and this element of EM3, but that's not there's there's not enough la layers to that to to really demonstrate it. So let me add another layer. So let me add uh, an element of D96. Okay, and notice I didn't write, so in the bar construction, this would be crossover sigma three, and this would be crossover sigma six, but I didn't write that here. And that corresponds to having these guys numbered, having these guys numbered independently. And when I do, when I do that crossover, it says, okay, I have to send the guy numbered by one here to the guy numbered by one here. I have to send the guy numbered by two to the guy numbered by two. 
and I have to send the guy numbered by three to the guy numbered by three, and so on. I can, um, instead of, right, so um, th these numbers, so if I, if I write just this product, these numbers are completely independent, but as a piece of the bar construction, these numbers aren't independent, they have to match up. Um, so in the piece I'm gonna, in the piece I'm gonna, let's look at the piece that corresponds to this, and I'm gonna get rid of those numbers when I, when I come up. There we go. Um, when I when I cross over sigma three and cross over sigma six, I have to make sure the numbers match up. So I might as well just number them by, um, you know, I might as well not number them at all and just keep track of which guys are going where. Okay, and um, so if I look, the partition on the outside. Um, um, one, three, and seven are together on the outside, and four and five are together on the outside. Two is by itself, eight is by itself, nine is by itself, and six is by itself. It doesn't matter what order I write these in. It's not an, you know, they're numbered by their numbers. I, I could have, maybe it would be more natural to put two there and put six there, but it doesn't matter. These are, these, these numbers are unordered. Okay, and then in this partition, um, right, I have to, I have to use the, the key here. Two goes to two and four goes to four. So two, one, two, three, and four, and five, I missed five somehow. One, two, yes, here's two, it has both four and five in it. Um, sorry, here's two and here's four, two and four. One, three, and seven, which were already together, get grouped now with four and five. And so the next partition is uh, one, three, four, five, seven. And um, likewise, two, eight, and nine all get grouped together. And six is, is um, six, which was, um, which was here, is still lonesome by himself because he goes to three, which was lonesome by himself. Okay, and so these are, these are the partitions here. Um, and so we look at, so the, the piece corresponding to this um, sequence of partitions, this level partition, um, is, the, is the bar construction, is the, um, is, the, uh, is the subspace of this product where we insist that, you know, one, three, and seven all go here. You know, four and five both go here, two goes here, six goes here, nine goes here, eight goes here. And the same thing on this level, okay? And so if you think about, um, if you think about what that space looks like, well, you know, you know where um, this guy is just an embedding of one disk in one disk. So that's a copy of D11. And then independently, we are embedding two disks in one disk. So that's a copy of D21. And independently, one disk in one disk, that's D11. Independently, three disks in one disk. That's D. That's D three one. Independently, one disk in one disk. That's one one. And independently, one disk in one disk. That's one one. And on this level, we're embedding two disks, two particular disks in one disk. So that's a copy of that. Three disks in a particular disk. That's a copy of that. And one disk in a particular disk. That's a copy of that. And on the outside, it's just three embeddings of disks in, uh, in the manifold. Okay, so that's what each of these pieces look like. So for each sequence of partitions, I'll get a component in the bar construction. And well, now we can really see that they're components. What the components will look like is on the outside, it's, it's just the embedding space. And then each of, the, each of the spaces on the inside is going to be a copy of, um, you know, D blank one. It's gonna be a product of copies of D blank one for various numbers. And those numbers are given by exactly what the partitions do. Okay, so that's, that's the picture. Um, and then the next thing I wanna say is these are, too, um, these are too fat. I hate to say it, but they're too fat. Um, and, um, but that's okay. Um, they're equivalent to something that's leaner and meaner. 
Um, they're equivalent to a space of embeddings, oops, um, that's much more constrained and more organized. So I want to look at embeddings um, that are a fixed type and size, and I want to insist on particular distance minima between the different disks. So I'll tell you what I mean in pictures and in words on the next slide. Um, but this distance minima between, uh, between different disks, that involves a scaling parameter. So let's fix a scaling parameter that I call alpha and alpha, just remember that alpha is bigger than one. In practice, alpha is a lot bigger than one. Okay, so um, let's just look at the, the, the basic guy. Um, this, this oh, sorry, I'm underlining the wrong one. The basic guy, if we look at embeddings of k copies of the disk and one copy of the disk, that's, a, that's the k space of the little disk operand. Let's look at, uh, let's take an r bigger than zero and let's look at the subspace of that where I look at just the embeddings where the image disks have radius exactly r. Remember, I could scale by anything as long as they all fit. But now I'm gonna look at the subspace where I only scale by r and I ask for the center points to be a certain distance apart for alpha r. So here's a picture of that. Well, this is a picture of an, of an element like that. Um, in, in fact, the disks are a little bit big, but I didn't want them to look like points. Um, so that all of these disks have the same radius and they're all um, a certain minimum distance apart. Uh, and this, um, if I look at the homotopy type of this or the inclusion of this and this, that's uh, exactly perfectly geared towards the, um, um, uh, the, um, the, the, the BBK uh, min-type Morse theory, the Baryshnikov, Bubinek, Kale, a min-type Morse theory. And if you apply that, that theory, what you see is that as long as R is small enough, the inclusion of this subspace in the space of all the possible embeddings um, that's a homotopy equivalence. In fact, it's a sigma k equivariant homotopy equivalence. You can flow these things sigma k equivariantly. Okay, so I can replace this flabby um, um, embedding space with, a, with, this, with this leaner embedding space where the disks have certain radiuses and I, I make sure they're, um, the center points satisfy certain minima, minimum distances. Okay. And now for the embedding space, I have to, um, I, I'm gonna phrase it in terms of distances. And for that, I need to pick a, a metric on M. And, you know, depending on how you framed M, M might already come with a metric. Like for example, I, in, in my exposition, M is parallelizable. So it in fact has a, a flat metric, but I, you know, for the general case that we consider, we can't just use a flat metric. Um, you know, if we were looking at G mod H, that doesn't have a flat metric typically. Um, so we need to do something more general. And you know, even if M comes with a metric already, let's pick a new metric on it, um, subject to the following um, sort of um, flatness hypothesis that all the sectional curvatures are between minus one and one, and all the convexity radi radii are greater than one. And you can always do this, right? Um, if if M is compact, given any metric, I can just scale that metric and, uh, and this will happen. And if M is not compact, well, I still can scale it and I scale it a little bit more in some places than others and I get a metric that satisfies this. So this is just some kind of, um, you know, this is some kind of normalization and constraint on, on the metric. So we just pick a new metric that, that has these properties and we can always do that. And, um, you know, what we end up with depends on the metric but I, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, in the end, it's going to be, you know, we'll, we'll use this metric in the proofs, and then it will, in the statements of theorems, it will it won't be involved. Okay, so we'll do the same kind of thing. Um, we're looking at, um, um, we're looking at embeddings of k copies of the disk in M, and let's look at embeddings that. Um, um, that are very close to the exponential map. I'd like to say, let's just look at embeddings that are given by scaling, you know, scaling the exponential map, but that's not gonna respect the action of um, the disks on it. So I have to do things that are, um, uh, that are an affine embedding in the unit K 
tangent space followed by an exponential map. So this is a very rigid space of embedding. I'm only going to look at things that are that are uh, related to the exponential map in a particular way, and I'm going to fix the scaling. And I'm also going to ask for the centers um, to be a certain distance apart. Okay, and then um, this is this was um, you can adapt the the or maybe maybe the right word is apply. You can again apply the min type Morse theory to show that um, as long as R is small enough, um, this space of embeddings, the inclusion of this space of embeddings in in our space of all of these embeddings is going to be an uh, it's going to be a homotopy equivalent. Okay, so here's a picture. You, you start off with these embeddings and you can flow them till you wind up with embeddings that have a, um, that are very close to the exponential map uh, with a certain scaling and a minimum distance. You see these guys, some of the guys moved away from each other and they all became very circular. Okay, so we have this um, we have these um, um, big pieces of the bar construction, and then we can find homotopy equivalent sort of leaner things that uh, that we can replace them with. Okay, so now, so that's um, that's what I want to say about pieces of the bar construction, and now I have to relate them to configuration spaces, and. Um, Given an embedding of disks in your manifold, we know how to build a configuration out of it. You take the center points, right? So given a, um, I don't have the picture for this, but that's not the manifold, there's the manifold. Given an embedding of a bunch of disks, you look at where the center points go and that gives you, that gives you a configuration. And now if I, you know, I've, I've indexed pieces of the bar construction on level partitions, and given a piece of the bar construction, that's a bunch of embeddings, an embedding of disks in the manifold, and then a bunch of embeddings of disks and other disks, I can compose all the way through. And that gives me an embedding of um, a bunch of disks just in M and look at where the center points of those disks go. But I start with the disks here, I look at the center points, I compose all the way through, and that gives me a configuration in M. Okay. So so this gives me, I guess I didn't write it here, but if I have a piece of the bar construction, I get a map to the configuration space by looking at the center point to the disk and for obvious reasons, we call this the center point map. Okay, but now instead, let's look at the homotopy equivalent um, constrained subspace. Um, so um, the, the piece itself was, um, was a product of things like this, and each of these things is itself a product of, um, I don't know what letters to use, uh, Q, a product of things like this, we can replace these guys with, with the, uh, and, uh, and this guy with the constrained versions, right? And we had two parameters, we had, um, we had a radius and we had our scaling parameter, we always use the scaling parameter alpha, you know, for fixed alpha. Um, we have to pick each of these R's and I wrote down exactly how we decide to pick them and the exact formulas aren't that important. Um, the thing to notice is that, um, that if you look at the sequence, um, if you look at the sequence, it's it's telescoping. So if I if I think about so these um, these R's give, you know, the size of the embedding, and together with alpha, they give uh, minimum distances for the center points to, to be apart. And when I can if I if I have a, a certain uh, scale here, when I compose, those scales are going to multiply. And when I compose all the way down, they're going to multiply all the way down. And if I look at if I look at this space and I look at, um, and I use these constraints and I look at uh, the constraints that imposes on the center points, I can multiply all these out. And if I simplify the formulas a little, what I get is that, um, what I get is that 
um, uh, the, you know, the resulting configuration, if I look at the center point of the disc labeled I and the disc labeled J, if they're in the same block of the partition at level P, it forces them to be this close. And if they're in different blocks, it forces them to be at least this far away from each other. Okay, and these guys differ by a factor of alpha. So they're either, um, they're either uh, close together or they're you know, alpha times that apart. Right? If they're in the same block at, at a particular level, they're this close. And if they're in a different block, they're, 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 they have to be far apart by a, farther apart by a factor of alpha. Okay, and I can just look at the open subset of configuration spaces of the configuration space of points that satisfy those constraints. And that's what this, that's what this U, this open set U is. If I have a level partition, if I have a sequence of partitions and coarsenings of the partition, I can define a open subspace of the configuration space um, by looking at the points that satisfy these distance inequalities. Okay, so here's a picture of that. So this is the, um, this is the configuration we looked at a few slides ago, uh, except written vertically instead of horizontally to fit more things on the page, right? We had this as the outer one. This was an element of, a, uh, uh, well, of um, you know, nine guys going into six guys, and this guy is six guys going into three guys, three guys going into the manifold. Okay, and so here's the flabby space, and then there's the more constrained space. There, there were no conditions on the outer thing. I, I didn't make a big deal about that, but that there are no, no conditions on the outer thing. But then, um, you know, but, but then when we look at the, the, um, the inside things, we, we force the embeddings to be a certain radius, and we enforce minimum distances uh, uh, between the points. Right, and then we we also um, uh, we also constrained the embeddings into the manifold by having a certain scaling, having it be close to the exponential map, and having uh, the distances between the points uh, be big. And now for this particular um, for this particular element of um, this embedding space, let's look at where the center points go. And I only drew. Um, I only drew a little uh, square near um, near that embedding, and um, so you know um, four and five, four and five uh, end up close together, and a bit further from one three seven, which end up close together, and then you know all the rest of the guys are so far away that they're that they're off the page, and I I, uh, I drew the circles that um, are that the that the constraints on here imply for the configurations. Um, the condition from partition zero forces um, certain guys to be less than alpha to the minus twelve if you're if you're keeping score, and those are the green circles. Um, so the guys that are in the same um, block of P0, like one, three, and seven, or separately four and five, they each have to be within the green circles from, from all those other points. Or the guys that are in different partitions, like one versus four or one versus five, they have to be uh, bigger than alpha to the 11, minus 11 from each other. Uh, those are the red circles, right? So everything in the same outer partition has to be within the green circles of each other and everything else has to be outside the red circle. The next partition gives other distance constraints that, that aren't shown. Um, you know, I could draw them on the manifold itself. Um, if I had another color, let me see if I have green. Ah! Let me see if I have green. I have green. Be something like that, maybe. Okay, so that's the picture. Um, and if you stare at this picture, it looks like really, um, you know, given these points, you could reconstruct, given these constraints, you could reconstruct where the disks, where the disks are. Hmm, that's funny. Let me try again. Right? 
right? You can almost reconstruct the, uh, the disk that's labeled here 45 and the disk that's labeled here 137. And it, you know, if you do it um, um, sort of uniformly in the, uh, in the subspace, you don't, um, you won't recover the original point that it came from, but you'll, you'll, you'll come close. And that's the essence of the theorem, which is at least if you take the scaling parameter large enough. And large enough actually only depends on n. It doesn't depend on the manifold. And that's because I, I normalized the choices with the, with the curvature and the um, convexity radius. Um, the center point match, map from the constrained space, which lands in this particular um, open subspace of the configuration space defined by those distance criteria. Uh, that's a that in, that the center point map is a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so this is, identifies the components of the bar construction, uh, their homotopy types, as um, in in terms of open subsets of the configuration space defined by um, defined by sort of inclusion. Uh, you know, closeness and farness conditions. Okay, so how do we use this? Um, so I didn't expect you to memorize the definition of U. I, I repeated it on this slide. If I have a sequence of partitions, then U is going to be the subspace of points in the configuration space where when you look at the else partition, um, the guys are supposed to be close if they're in the same block and they're supposed to be further away by a factor of alpha if they're in different blocks. Okay, and now if you think about this, this is expressed in terms of each of the partitions, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a conjunction uh, of each of the partitions. So if I look at the conditions for just a single partition, this guy for the sequence of partitions is just gonna be the intersection. Right? You satisfy all of, you, you know, you just look at the guys that satisfy the conditions for P0, that's this guy, and you look at the ones that satisfy the, the, the conditions at each level and you take the intersection, that's exactly uh, this guy based on the levels. Um, another thing is that um, if, you, if you just look at, if you look at some arbitrary partitions, P and Q, and you look at their intersection, well, it could be that one is a refinement of the other, and then you're looking at one of these um, subspaces. But if neither one is a refinement of the other, that means that there's something going on with the blocks that's incompatible, and that forces these inequalities to be incompatible, and that forces the intersection to be empty. And it's sort of if and only if, if alpha is large enough, um, this intersection is not empty exactly when um, one of the guys is a refinement of the other. Okay. And um, so if you think about that, you also have a simplicial structure on, um, on, on disjoint unions of, of these open sets by, um, at least if you're consistent about it, by dropping partitions or repeating partitions. And if you think about the simplicial set you get, what it is is it's exactly because of, because of this, it's exactly a check complex. It's a check complex for, um, you know, the, uh, for the open sets that you that you choose to include in the particular construction that you're doing. Okay, and what uh, what what I had discussed on the previous slides, you have these maps, um, the map from the constrained guy into the bar construction guy, and the map from the constrained guy into um, the open subset guy. These maps are compatible with the simplicial structure. Um, and we can use them to prove um, equivalence theorems between certain bar constructions and certain open subsets of configuration spaces. But if I take the geometric realization of a check complex, uh, what I get is the union of the cover, All right? So when I take geometric realization, I get, there should not be an alpha here. Uh, when I take geometric realization, here I get some kind of bar construction thing here I get, well, something equivalent to it, and here I get uh, an, an open subspace of the configuration space. And that's how we, that's how we make this work. 
Okay, uh, first of all, let's thank uh, Michael. And we have some time for questions. I have a question, I guess. Um, if I see a bar construction and refinements of partitions, I start thinking about all the work Michael Ching and Greg Arone have done with, you know, models that are, is this, and they, and they, I think, have gotten close to fact, this mentioning factorization homology in some of their papers. Is this related to that? Anything they've done at all? Well, I don't know if it, if it is, um, specifically, um, um, I, I, you know, I don't know any, any specifics, but, uh, you know, um, of, of course, um, um, you know, uh, disc constructions with disks and, um, and, you know, configuration spaces are, are always closely related. And this is, you know, this is another example of, of that kind of thing. Um, you know, it may be that, um, you know, it, it may be that, um, um, you know, that th th there may be some overlap, but I don't, I don't know what it is. Other questions? I, I had one right at, um, at the beginning. Um, when you're trying to construct this smash over G mod H of A, um, the first thing I thought of was the paper covering homology by Brun, Carlson, and Dundas, where they do a construction very much like that. Uh, they give a, a functorial construction of such an object. Um, is there any relationship to their construction in what you're doing? Yeah, so um, maybe uh, there was a, a, I glossed over a, um, a certain point, which is that, um, um, you know, the, the generality in which we can do this construction, I, I discussed it from the, the point of view of the group, but you could also ask the question from the point of view of the algebra. And if you take, for example, the sphere spectrum, is that what I want to take? Um, I, I guess I don't want to take the sphere spectrum per se, um, but if I take a, uh, a commutative ring spectrum, then, then there's no trouble doing these constructions and, um, and you can, um, you, you can, there's, there's no trouble doing these constructions and even doing them genuine equivariantly. And, um, and that's, um, that's the kind of thing that they look at. In fact, they must be, in, in some sense, really, in some sense, they must be looking at the sphere spectrum because they're talking about the, the Siegel conjecture, right? But somehow, if you, if you do it to the sphere spectrum, you just get the sphere spectrum. So I, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, yes, I mean, that's, um, that's wh what they talk about is a, is, is a case where we actually do have these HHR norms. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, I'm the application. The same, same I'm sorry. Uh huh. Okay. The application they have in mind is a sort of X fold smash product of A, where X is any, uh, some, you know, simplicial complex. And uh, in particular, X is the N torus gives you a sort of N fold THH. And then yeah. so that's, the uh, that's an isogenies of the N torus will out give you a, an action on the N fold THH from that. That was, I think, the motivation. Yeah, so that, that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. Um, and um, right, so, um, so, you know, going in one direction, we, we know how to make sense of, so yeah, I mean, yes, I'm talking about exactly the same thing. And um, um, I'm just talking about, um, I'm just talking about doing it for more general things than, uh, than than E infinity ring spectrum. I'm, 
talking about doing it for like PN ring spectra instead of E infinity ring spectra. More questions? Uh, there's one in the chat. Yeah, I'm reading it. I'm just trying to. Um, so the question is, can I say a few more words on the second point um, of what are the issues about, um, you know, uh, let me let me try to go back to that. Uh, I think the way to go back is like so. Go back to that slide. Let's see. No, too far. Okay, here we are. Um, yeah, can I say more about um, can I say more about this point? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, what happens is you want to know what the geometric fixed points of that kind of construction is. And if you look at a normal subgroup, you have no trouble saying what happens. But if you look at a um, subgroup that's not normal, you have like a double coset formula. And um, that's hard to write down <laughs> in this context. Um, and that's that's where the you're right. If you think about if you think about the double coset formula for, for finite groups, that breaks into um, discrete cases where you know you have different double cosets. But um, but over a compact Lie group, these these are parameterized by something, right? And that's why. You end up with, you end up possibly needing to look at parameterized spectra. Um, so maybe the, the further thing to say about that is um, uh, it looked hard, and we already had these issues to deal with. So we said, let's tackle these and put this away for later. And so I don't know much about uh, that, except that uh, it looks like it's going to be complicated. More questions? Okay, if not, I am going to stop the recording.